challenges the status quo in all of his endeavors. Um, he gives creative space for you guys to think outside the box and connect. He's going to inspire and empower you today. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan Parker to the stage. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. How many of you actually brought your lunch? Excellent. Well done, fall instructors. How many of you are going to lunch afterwards? All right, so the rest of you are going to go hungry. So this will be a great crowd. Your stomach will be rumbling. It'll be great. Well, I'm Jonathan Parker. I'm thrilled to be with you this morning. So before I talk for the next several minutes, I want to give you a chance to talk. Okay? So I need you to pick a neighbor closest to you. Now, choose carefully because you're going to make some person's day, and then you're going to offend the person you don't choose. Okay? And that will be the worst part of their day. So choose carefully and look at your neighbor. You're going to have 60 seconds each, so that's two minutes, to answer this question. What do you believe are people's deepest desires? What do you believe are people's deepest desires? Choose a neighbor, one or two, and answer that question. Go! your last thoughts, your last pearls of wisdom. Excellent. So being the conversation guy, one of the things I just dislike the most is interrupting people having a conversation. So uh, what are some of the things that you thought about, talked about? What do you think are people's deepest desires? You can just yell them out. Happiness. Happiness. Love. Love. Fame. 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 Not embarrassing yourself. Not embarrassing yourself. Good. Yes. What else? Belonging. Goodness. Belonging. What else? Relationship, yes, sir. Significance. Significance, good. What else? Being who valued. Say again. Purpose. Purpose. So I agree with all of you. I think all of those things matter, and all of those things matter to me as well. But see, standing on this stage today is is slightly strange, specifically for my mother uh, and my grandmother, who generally chuckles a little bit every time she hears that I'm speaking publicly. And the reason for that is I had seizures when I was a baby. And for the majority of the first early years of my life, almost up to between four and five, I did not speak. Now, I grunted and had my own language, which if you're a mother or an auntie in the room, you learn the grunts of a four-year-old. But I, I, didn't, I didn't talk. Uh, I, I failed first grade. Apparently, they want you to be able to, you know, like draw and talk and read well when you uh, go through first grade. So failing first grade, you know, that does something to the self-esteem, but I didn't talk well. Talking for me was a difficult process. It had to take a lot of work from my mother and some other teachers throughout the majority of my life. But for a child who is sick with seizures, I don't remember that. But what I do remember is being a severe asthmatic and allergic to just about everything outside. I also remember in high school getting stomach ulcers so badly that I would lose pound after pound in such a short time and I couldn't eat and I couldn't hold any food down. And I became weak and I became exhausted. And of course, like any good high school student, I became bitter and resentful and asked, why me? Uh, and just add into that, I had acne since like sixth grade. I mean, this was rough living. And then I moved to college just to suffer severe liver dysfunction, and multiple organs beginning to fail. See, when my mom hears, you're speaking publicly, even today, and I've been speaking for a while, she chuckles a little bit and gets a little bit teary-eyed, right? Because I'm not supposed to be here. Can, can any of you empathize with that? Are you in a career, are you in a space where you're not supposed to be? Like you look yourself in the mirror and you're like, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be doing this. But see, one of the things you can do when you're sick, one of the things you can do when you're not feeling well, one of the things you can do when you're still mad and angry at life is you can actually still run your mouth. And for a guy who wasn't really good at it, when I got good at it, I never stopped. Okay, just keep going. And one of the things that happened to me was I wanted to learn everything I could about the conversation. And by learning everything I could about a conversation, I learned what I believe are people's deepest desires. 
And like I said, I agree with all of you. Yet I believe that all of those desires that you threw out at me all actually are rooted in these two. And the two desires that I think we all universally share, regardless of race and nationality, gender, age, it goes across the board, is that we all have the desire for the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. To have the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. Now let me prove that to you. I have three children. Their ages are four, three, two. I'll let you do the math later. Four, three, two, we have a busy house. And my little son, Zion, who just turned two, he, all he wants is the opportunity to communicate. And he will scream as loud as he can until I get him out of that crib. Until I give him the respect to listen to him, he is going to want the opportunity to communicate. But see, I also have a grandmother who is well over 90, who's, who's ailing in health, right? Anyone who's lived over 90 generally starts to do that. And even though Zion's brain's going a million miles a minute and he can scream at the top of his lungs, Graham, she's a little slower. But you know what Grandma wants from her kids, from her grandkids, from her great-grandkids? She wants the same thing as Zion does. She wants the opportunity to communicate. And she wants her kids and her grandkids to give her the respect to take the time to listen to her. Think about your spouse, your significant other, your children, your parents, your boss, your employees, your peers, the people you see on the street. All of them want the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. And I realized that when these desires were fulfilled in my life, everything got better. Life improved. Why? Because I found out that my deep desires of having the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard, when fulfilled, I am able to release a creative power and inspiring and empowering other people to create what I call art. Now, how many of you are artists? Awesome. One. He had to come from Miami, Greenville. I mean, oh, two, right? Okay, but here's the thing. You are an artist. You are an artist. Using nothing other than your words, you create a picture that is impossible to be, able to be captured in, in, on canvas or on film or even sculpted through clay. The words you use create what I call vocal art, and that vocal art is your conversation. Yet most people treat their words like, like a reckless artist who would just take paint on his hands and throw it against the canvas with some hope, sheer desire that something beautiful will be the result. And that's how we treat conversations. We take these words, this paint that we have, and we recklessly and carelessly and unthoughtfully use them at people, towards people. And we create bad vocal art. And maybe what is even more disconcerting is that we've just become accustomed to accepting bad vocal art. We're used to people going, oh, no, that's not what I meant. Or, oh, no, 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 you took that the wrong way. Or, well, no, that, no, you just don't understand me. Because we had bad art. We had bad conversations. See, when you grow up not being able to speak very well, you're not given a lot of leeway not to speak well once your mother has spent so much time working with you. She's like, I spent this much time working on you. You're going to speak right. Now, she won't like that when she hears that in the video, but she wanted me to speak well. So what I want to give to you today as a gift, I want to empower you to be able to create remarkable vocal art. You're going to leave here today with practical takeaways, easy to implement principles that you can begin to create remarkable vocal art, which will differentiate you as a vocal artist, the conversationalist. It will differentiate your business, your team. You will be known and remembered for your meaningful and memorable conversations. And here's the guarantees I promise. I promise guarantees. If you consider and take your conversation seriously, here, here are my guarantees. First, you'll have clearer communication with everyone. You, as a vocal artist, will have clearer communication, deeper relationships, and greater productivity. Clearer communications, deeper relationships with one another and your team members and your family, and greater productivity for your business and for your, your wallet and for that idea that you want to see take over the world. And I believe that all of those things are only possible 
through using conversation and understanding that it is vocal art. So how do we create remarkable vocal art? I'm so glad you asked. There are four elements to a conversation. There are four elements to your vocal art, and we will touch on all of them briefly today. First is curiosity. Second is questions. Third is listening. And fourth is sharing. So let's look at curiosity. Curiosity is the canvas to all of your vocal art. And just think about this practically. You wouldn't have a conversation with someone that you weren't curious about. You wouldn't engage an idea or discuss a topic that you weren't curious about. We just wouldn't do that. We would stay silent. And part of the reason we have lost the art of having a conversation, the ability and the skill to have a conversation is we've, we've been denied, almost robbed of the opportunity to be curious. Just think about it. 40 years ago, if you had to find something out, what would you do? What would you do? Say again. Go to the library. Go to the library. Good. And what would you do once you got to the library? You would ask for somebody. Hey, and all that Dewey Decimal System stuff, right? Do you know that's still in existence today? I tell my kids we're going to a museum and we go to the downtown library. I'm like, look, right? That's a joke. I love the library. I read more books. Okay, here we go. But look, look, you would go and you'd ask somebody. And if you needed to work around your house and there was something wrong with your, your plumbing, who would you call? Plumber. And you would talk to them. If you need to find out how to do something today, what do you do? Google it. Now, this is not my hatred towards Google. I'm really thankful for Google. But Google has begun to rob us of curiosity, right? Because we do things like, yeah, I've been researching that. <laughs> yeah, and studies prove, and at least we know everything's true on the internet, so we can take comfort in that. <laughs> but we've lost the opportunity to be curious because we have so many technology devices at our disposal, and I'm thankful for those, right? I mean, look, I'm on a lot of them. Okay, so I'm not dinging them. But what I am saying is the collateral damage of having so much technology and so much information on our palm is that we lose the opportunity to be curious. And then if you're actually curious, a, a, another human is like, what is your deal, man? Google it. I don't have time to talk to you. And what was once this communal pleasure, like, man, I get to share with you what I know. I get to talk to you about what I'm good at, all of these years of school I've spent, or all of this technical skill that I've learned, or all of these numbers I had to learn in the library with all the periods and all that. I get to share it with you. It was a pleasure. But now it's just annoying. You want to know what? Google it. Again, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's robbing people of curiosity. So even though there might not be anything wrong with Googling something, there is a danger in losing curiosity. But the second part is curiosity's got a bad rap, not just because we just Google everything now and don't talk to people, but what did curiosity do? It killed a cat. Now, I'm a dog person, so cats can die left and right, but, <laughs> but if you associate curiosity with killing something, no one's lining up for that. But what if curiosity didn't kill the cat? What, what if the cat got stronger? What, what if the cat did something he didn't think he could do, and then he did it, and he realized he could do it, so now he's stronger for it? Is there anything in your life that you were told you can't do? Well, that will destroy you. That will kill you. That will ruin your career. You could never do that. Don't, don't be curious about doing that. No, 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 no. You just play within the bounds of your business. And then you do it, and you're like, Oh, man, that worked. I'm a little stronger for it. Even if you fail, but you learn and get stronger. So the other problem is we've associated curiosity with things that kill animals. And we got to get rid of that, because what if the cat got stronger? What if you just started putting that around your office? What if the cat got stronger? What if curiosity, this canvas for conversation, is what will actually make us stronger? So what is this canvas, though? What do I, if I don't believe that curiosity is something that kills the cat but makes it stronger, how do we do that? Well, first, curiosity is courageous. In a world of happily Googling people, which I'm thrilled at, in that world of people who would just rather isolate themselves to figure out everything else on their own, who don't want to engage and don't want to be curious, self-proclaimed experts in every field, for you to step up and go, I don't know, will you help me? 
is a courageous act. If you're a business leader here or a CEO or president of a company, and you get a millennial that wears skinny jeans with a beard, bald head, and really goofy glasses, this guy, coming to you and saying, I don't know something, realize that in a culture of Googling and a culture of you've got to figure it out yourself, they are taking a courageous act. They're coming to you because they believe you're an expert. They're coming to you because they trust what you have to say. They are taking a courageous act by simply saying, I don't know. But the other thing, curiosity, is it's connecting. So just think about that. Yeah, I just, my dad had the same electrician forever uh, until he passed away a couple years ago. And these two men spent no time outside of working on electricity in my house. They didn't like go to McDonald's. They didn't eat like milkshakes, none of that. They only saw each other when it was time to do the electrical work at the house. But because they were curious about what one another was doing in that moment, they were connected. See, curiosity is connecting because when you share something that I don't know and I learn, I'm more connected to you. And when I can share something that you don't know, I'm more connected to you. See, curiosity is connecting. So it's both courageous and connecting. But third, it's contagious. All you need in your company is one person to be curious. Just one. One person to ask the right question, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. One person to just push against the status quo. One person to say, why, why are we always doing it this way? What if we tried this? You just need one, because it, it it's contagious. Because people start going, you didn't die with the cat? No, this worked. We're moving forward. So curiosity is contagious. It spreads almost like a virus. And this is the canvas. Curiosity is the canvas in which you create your vocal art, your conversation. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, I think at a child's birth, Eleanor Roosevelt said, if a mother could ask a fairy godmother to endow it with the most useful gift, that gift would be curiosity. If a fairy godmother could give as a gift the most useful gift, it would be curiosity. Be curious. But on this canvas, we need to add some color. And there's just three colors I want to talk about today. And those are the three other elements of your vocal art, which is questions, listening, and sharing. And just due to time, we're going to look at the reality, the rule, and the reward under each one. And we're just going to have time to talk about one piece under each. And the reality of questions is that we don't have a lot of good question askers. We have a lot of good talking heads. That just turn on any news program. I think one of the best decisions I made a couple years ago was just canceling cable, just canceling it. Now, and now I miss sports, which is really sad. But just cancel. Why? Because people just talk 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At any point, they just talk, they talk, they talk. And when they do ask a question, it's not really a question. It's just a statement with wrong punctuation, right? Like, sir, you know you're wrong, right? Like things like that, just wrong punctuation. And, and even in business meetings, or in peer groups. It's not about question asking. It's about who gets to talk the longest, the fastest, and have the greatest story. It's like this one-upping game. So the reality is we don't have a lot of great question askers. We have a lot of talking heads. So if you want to create memorable and meaningful vocal art, what is the one rule that I want to, want to leave with you today in regards to questions? And that rule is ask what and how questions rather than why questions. When it comes to relational conversation, ask what and how questions rather than why questions. Now, most of you probably have heard of Simon Sinek. Raise your hand, Simon Sinek. Power of Why, great TED Talk, good book, amazing thought leader. And I agree with him on this element that why questions should be reserved for philosophical conversation, right? You should know why your business exists. You should know why you decided to do this program. You should know why on a a psychological and philosophical level why you get out of bed every morning. Yet when it comes to relational questions, why questions are toxic. And here's why. Why questions on a relational level put people on the offensive or the defensive. But most people go through life like fists up or fists out, right? They're always looking to defend themselves or go on the offense to knock somebody out using their words, hopefully. Knocking someone out with your fist will put you in jail, right? But using your words, right? They go through life, offense or defense, and why questions are arming. 
Why did you do that? Why do you think that way? Why didn't you respond to that email? Why are you late? Why didn't you pick up when I called? Why didn't you get the milk? I mean, looking at my four-year-old son, why did you do that? He's four. The, the, his brain isn't even developed yet to understand the question I just asked him. And he immediately what? Starts to defend himself or go on the offense towards me telling me what I did wrong. Because relationally, why questions are toxic. toxic. It's like kryptonite. It weakens people or it's like fuel and it gets them hot. But what and how questions? Allow that person to tell you a story. Allow, allows that person to engage with you in a conversation. Hey, just out of curiosity, great phrase. Out of curiosity, what, what made you late today? Oh, well, this is what happened. Hey, how did your day go yesterday? I sent an email and, it, and he didn't get to it. Just how was your day yesterday? Rather than why didn't you get back to me? See, just adding two or three words, which might take 10 more seconds of your time and asking a what and how question, you are breaking the reality of just having them be a talking head and you're asking a question that actually lets that person know you're interested in their story. You're actually interested in what happened to them. See, these what and how questions are actually disarming. So if a relational why question is arming, a what and how question during a relationship, whether that's with a friend or a peer, an employee or a superior, it actually disarms and allows you to have a conversation. So the reality is we have talking heads, but the rule that I want you to leave with is ask what and how questions, not why. And if you pay attention, you will be shocked. How many times do you have to correct yourself because you ask why questions? You notice I have to say, nope, hold on. What made you do that? Rather than why did you do that? And then what's this reward? Th this reward is clarity. See, just think about it. If someone's on the offense or the defense, most of the time they're not clear. Just picture a boxer in your mind, right? If he's on the defense and he's protecting himself, he's not thinking really clearly about where the next punch is going to go or where he's going to go in the ring, right? He's just trying to survive. Same thing in the conversation. If you ask a why question, that person's not thinking clearly and they're just trying to get out of the round. Or if it moves them to the offensive and you ask a why question, think about when you're on the offensive and you're hot and you're angry, you're upset, you don't have clarity. But when you're disarmed and you ask somebody a what and a how question or somebody asks you a what and a how question, you're able to provide clarity. But not only are you allowed to provide clarity, you also receive clarity. And then that person, that vocal artist is creating an artwork that is representing not only what you're talking about, but is a reflection of them, and you are now connected even more. So on the canvas of curiosity, our first color that we paint with is questions. But the second color, which is possibly the hardest color to paint with, is this idea of listening, of listening. So questions and listening. When I started this journey of discovering all I could about a conversation, one of the main reasons for it was I was regularly told I was a bad listener, just by just about everybody. You don't listen, you're a bad listener, you're always interrupting, you're not paying attention. In this weird phrase, you hear me but you're not listening, right? That's one of those you know, psychological mind traps, like I don't know how to get out of that. But I just was a bad listener. So the first thing I really started to look at was like, what, what makes me such a bad listener? Like, how can I be a better listener? And here's why I realized part of the reason I was a terrible listener is that we live in a culture of immediate satisfaction, immediate response. I mean, you can go to a furniture store at 8 a.m. on a Monday and there's a sign, have it by 3 p.m. today. Like, okay, that one. Why? Maybe not because you like it. I mean, my wife and I did this for our first couch, right? We had no furniture in our apartment. We walked in, we're like, what's the fastest couch we can have? And they're like, Brown, we're like, cool, and that's the one we still have today, right? Why, because we want it immediately. The iPhone, the, the iMessage app with the three little dots, you know what I'm talking about? And you see the dots going, and you're like, oh, they're responding, and then the dots go away and there's no message, and you're like, what is that? <laughs> Don't they know who I am? And then you see that person, and the first thing you say is what? Did, did, you, did you get my text? How about you just say what you texted him? Hey, you know, where do you want to go for lunch, right? 
Right, we want immediate response. And then if you have an Android device, people, like that doesn't help me at all. I text and it's that green box, and I'm like, how am I supposed to be satisfied if I don't know if you got my text or not? Why well, we want immediate response and the, the collateral damage of this, the problem, the reality is we have active responders but passive listeners. The reality of our listening culture is that we have active responders. We're ready to go. We don't even read the whole post on Facebook. We just dislike it or smiley face it or add our comment right below. We, we don't even have time for the person to finish their whole idea, right? Halfway through the sentence, you know why they're wrong. But may I, may I suggest that if you only listen to them halfway, you only can respond halfway, which makes you half wrong too. Most of us just wait for people to stop talking so that we can start. And we're actively responding, actively responding, right? We walk into meetings and go, hey, we got to get this done because I got another one in 15 minutes. What do you think that does to the value of the person that's trying to talk to you? You've just said, I'm not going to listen, so make this quick. We have active responders, but passive listeners. And this is detrimental to conversations, to vocal art. Because if you're only listening to that person painting halfway, you're only getting half of the painting. If you're only listening to your employee half the time because you're just ready to answer them and move on, just ready to respond, you're only listening to them half the time. We must, we must, for the sake of our vocal art, for the sake of your business and for our culture, realize that it's okay to take a deep breath and let someone finish a sentence. Now, I grew up in an Italian-Irish household <laughs> in Connecticut. If you didn't catch, like, catch the last word on someone else's sentence, you weren't getting a word in edgewise. Then I came down here to the Great South, bless your heart, and like all of you just had a lot of time to like in between. But what I am seeing is for companies and teams and friendships and families that just say, you know what, we're going to listen with as much energy as we put into talking. Their company changes, their business changes, their customer relations change, and they get clearer communications and deeper relationships and greater productivity. So if the reality is we're, we've created active responders but passive listeners, what's the one rule I want you to walk out with today? So the first rule under questions was ask what and how, not why. Here's the rule for listening. Listen for perspective before offering your perception. Listen for perspective before offering your perception. Now let me explain that to you. Perspective is inside out. None of you know what it's like to be Jonathan Parker. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that has a perspective of what it's like to be me. It's inside out. But all of you have perceptions on me because perception is outside in. So when I say listen for perspective, I'm saying listen for the person closest to the center who's closest to the conversation that is at hand. I am not saying they're right. I'm not saying their perspective is right, but the perspective is inside out and perceptions outside in. I was moderating a forum um, a few years ago after the incredible amount of shootings that took place across our country. There's a lot of these types of forums coming up. And we had several representative leaders from Greenville, and, and two of them was, one was a young African-American, soon-to-be lawyer, and another one was a police officer uh, who was white. And, and I looked at the police officer and I said, sir, have you ever been black in Greenville? And he laughed. He said, no, no, not at all. I said, great. All you have is perception of what it's like to be a minority in Greenville. And then I looked at the young man and I said, have you ever been blue? And he laughed and he's like, no. I said, okay. So all you have is a perception on what it's like to be a police officer in Greenville. I said, if we can listen to one another's perspectives and then share one another's perceptions after listening to one another, we will have a remarkable conversation. Because most arguments around sensitive subjects or any subject, including Clemson football versus you know, Gamecock football, right? Any subject is mostly around arguing perceptions. Well, this is what I think of you. Well, this is what I think of you. Well, this is what I think of what you did. Well, this is what I think about what you did. And no one sits down and goes, hey, you were in the meeting. I heard about the meeting, but you were, you were in the meeting. Can you just tell me what your perspective was? 
hey, CEO, president, boss, team leader, you have a perspective of what it's like to lead your team. From your point of view, right? You're the leader. You've got all this pressure and all this responsibility. You have the perspective of what it's like to lead. But your team members have a perception of what it's like to be led by you. You don't have that perception. So what would it look like in your quarterly meetings or your, uh, your every six-month meeting just going, hey, out of cur- just out of curiosity, what's it like working for me? What's the perception you have of my leadership ability? Now, you get to do this once and respond correctly. And we'll talk about that sharing in a minute. Because all you have is perception or perspective on what it's like to lead, but no perception on yourself. So one of the greatest things that happened to me in my conversation was I started to go to people and say, hey, what is, what is your perception, the outside view in, on how good I am of a listener? And all of them said, you're terrible at it. Now, I could have responded with, defriend, not going out anymore with you, right? Could have done that. Or I could have said, all right, help me get better because my perspective is I'm good at it. And then they worked with me. And guess what? Because I listened to their perception, my perspective changed. And now I had a better perspective because my perspective was wrong. And just think, maybe your perception about a situation is one thing, but when you take the time to purposely and intentionally listen to the actual perspective, maybe your perception can change. See, a lot of emotional energy and burn relational capital will go away if we just listen to one another intentionally and purposely. Because reality is we have active responders but passive listeners and the rule is I want you to listen for perspective before offering your perception and then here's here's the reward here's the reward by listening this way you will develop empathy now if I was a bad listener I was even worse empathizer like understanding like walking in someone else's shoes I could not do anyone know strength finders in here yeah Okay, empathy is so low, I don't even know if it made it on the list for me, right? I mean, it is just buried down there. And I was content at some point going, I'll have to be empathetic. It's just not my gift. It's not my strength. I don't have to do it. That's not how you listen to someone. That's just being unkind and rude. So I actually had to learn what it was like to be empathetic. And how I learned to be empathetic was by listening to someone all the way through. And Brene Brown has done remarkable work on vulnerability and empathy, and I love her definition. She says this, empathy is simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connected, and communicating the incredible healing message of you are not alone. Whatever generation you are or however you grow grew up, there's always space to connect with someone. So whether you're a 20-year vet in your career, you, you have to remember what it was like to be in year two. And just because you were treated poorly by your superiors in year two doesn't mean you got to do the same. And hey, year two people, listen, you don't get to be year 20 people just because you think you are. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm all for motivational videos. I watch like five or six a day, right? I stand in front of the mirror and go, I am Superman before I come and talk up here because I still get nervous doing this. But sometimes we want to rush development that needs to be slowly understood by learning empathy. And you learn empathy, the reward of being able to connect with an individual and hold space with an individual is found in learning to listen, to postpone judgment and disagreement or agreement for the sole purpose of just listening. Just listening. So we have this canvas of curiosity that we all do our vocal art on because we're all artists. So next time we're in a room and I say, how many of you are artists? Everyone's hand's going to go up. That, there will be a quiz later. So pay attention. Okay. We are all artists painting on the canvas of curiosity with questions and listening. And then lastly, sharing sharing. Mark Twain has a quote. He says, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember everything. And this brings us to this idea of sharing. Now, hear me. I didn't say giving or throwing or passing it off or getting it off my chest. 
That's not a conversation. That's, that's a monologue. And no one likes to be on the other side of your monologue. Okay, no one likes that. See, sharing is about holding space. Sharing is about being together in a moment, and it's about sharing who you are. See, sometimes we think about this Mark Twain quote, or I think about it, hopefully you'll think about it now, as in just the, the words we say about a score or what we thought about a restaurant or how our day went. Or when someone asks you, how, how's it going? And you're like, good, and it's terrible, right? You think like, oh, they're not going to come back and ask me again. But when I talk about this, when you tell the truth, I'm talking about your whole life, sharing who you are. Because the reality is most people live with prescribed authenticity. We're not really authentic anymore. We put on authentic, authenticity to be connected or associated with or a part of a group, a movement, or, or a club. We're not really ourselves. We sacrifice that for acceptance. But we only find it to be lacking because we're not accepted for who we are. We're accepted for who we told people we were. And then the Mark Twain quote gets complicated because you got to remember that facade all the time. It, prescribed authenticity is a little bit like fashion, okay? It's a little bit like fashion. Um, there's really only a few truly remarkable and outstanding fashionable people in the world. The rest of us, like myself, buy their clothes off mannequins and, and call ourselves fashionable. Oh, man, I, those jeans would look good on me. Who, who wore those first, right? Like, don't get me wrong, I'm wearing skinny jeans, and I get that, right? I'm very comfortable with this, right? I'm sharing all of who I am. But I remember like thinking, like, why would people wear these things? They have to be the most uncomfortable thing in the world, right? And don't get me wrong, they're not the most comfortable thing in the world either, don't get me wrong. But I remember thinking, like, who said, let's take really baggy jeans and like suction cup them to people's legs, right? Like, how did that, how did that happen? But now people wear them. And now they're associated with a movement. And now they're like this, they got this long list of who they are. That's prescribed authenticity. You want to know why I bought these jeans? My wife liked them, and I'm a good husband, right? Because I would have been up here in sweatpants and a t-shirt. See, prescribed authenticity is what people go through. Well, this is what an accountant's supposed to be like. It's what a CEO's supposed to do. This is what a personal assistant's supposed to do. And, and we just put all this stuff on and we have this long list of things that we judge a person against the crowd, not the individual. Because we're not asking questions and we're not listening. So we really don't know authentically who that person is. The reality is we all battle prescribed authenticity. We all battle what it's like to wonder, am I going to be accepted or not for being me? Am I going to be rejected for being me? Are people going to like me for being me? Well, I, I'd rather be rejected for who I am rather than be rejected for what I thought you wanted. And I'd rather be accepted for who I am than rather put on a facade and buy a fancy jacket to make you feel like this is who I am. If you run a company or you're going to start a company, resist at all cost prescribed authenticity because that's the reality most people live in. So if most people have prescribed authenticity in, in art, right, we're talking about being vocal artists, in art it, it's called a forgery. So if you need something a little more blunt, if you don't wanna be a forgery and you wanna be a true original, you need to learn, and here's the rule, share authentically. The, the definition of authentic can, can get very long, right? But one of the ones I love is an undisputed genuineness. An undisputed genuineness. Be you. Do you know that there's no one else like you in the entire world? No one. No one that looks exactly like you. No one who thinks exactly like you. No one who has the stories that you have. No one that has the, op the exact opportunities you have. Do you know there is no one like you in the world? You are an undisputed, genuine, original. Why are you sacrificing, giving that up to be like someone else you see on YouTube. You're the most original person you know. The person looking back at you in the mirror every morning is the most creative, unique individual you know, and you get to be that person. That's the most liberating thing when I realize there's no one else like me, so it's going to be me. There's no other me to compare me to. And the same thing goes for you. You're you. That means your employees are them. 
I think it was Steve Jobs who said, why would you hire smart people then tell them what to think? Right? Like, why would you hire individuals and then tell them, don't be original? Like, why would you do that philosophically? And then what and how? How are you going to lead a bunch of people who are just really robots off of an assembly line? See, we want to be authentic. Now, there's levels of appropriateness, right? I mean, Jamie said I could wear whatever, but I think sweatpants and a t-shirt, that would have been weird. Just weird, right? So there's levels of appropriateness in sharing. But when you're being curious about a person and asking questions and you're listening and you get to this part of authentic, like, yeah, that's just who this guy is or that's just who this woman is. Like, at least they're being them and they're doing a great job and the morale's great and we have clear communications and deeper relationships and we're making more money and we're pushing out our idea and we're changing the world because we let people be who they are. Because the reality is we have a bunch of people prescri being prescribed authentically. So the rule is be you, share you, be authentically you, be undisputed, undisputed, genuine. And here's the reward. It leads to truth. It leads to truth. It's what, exactly what Mark Twain said. I mean, most of you I'm just meeting for the first time. Some of you I know a little bit here and there. And most of my friends, however you know me, if they sat around and talked about me behind my back, they would all say, yeah, he's kind of always that excited. He's kind of always just, his hands are everywhere, right? He talks fast. He's kind of always that way. People, my wife tells people, being married to me is like a roller coaster, right? There's only highs, there's only lows, and they're both that extreme, right? That's just kind of how it is. And they probably both say he talks about conversation a lot. He talks about his faith a lot. He talks about his work in the city a lot. I just want to be me all the time. I don't have to worry if you talk about me behind my back if I'm me. If I'm me, you can talk about me behind my back all you want because I told the truth. I told the truth. See, on this canvas of curiosity, we are all artists that paint using nothing other than our words with questions, listening, and sharing. But what is the final product? The final product, I'm going to talk about my favorite artist. He also happens to be local here. Jared Emerson is my favorite artist. I am fortunate to have three of his prints in my house. Generally around Black Friday, he always offers a discount on prints, and I'm always like on my phone ready to buy one. But the coolest thing about Jared Emerson is when he's doing a performance art piece, when he's painting either it's a football player or a musician or, or a person in the faith community, when he's, just, when he's just painting, the music's going, and he's getting close to the end, right? The big reveal, you know it's Prince or Jobs or you know, Dabo Sweeney, like you know who it is. And he goes over and he puts paint on his hand. And he kind of looks out in the crowd just a little bit, and he turns around to the... Uh, to his canvas, and he jumps as high as he needs to, or as high as he can at that moment. He takes that hand, he takes that hand, and he smacks it against the canvas. And then he steps down and the performance is done. See, what Jared just demonstrated for us is he painted the subject matter, right? He painted the person he was supposed to paint. Just like you have a conversation about budgets or uh, salaries or performance reviews, where you have conversations about where you're going for dinner, right? You talk about a subject, you paint with your words a subject. But what Jared Emerson does is he takes that hand and he smashes it up on the canvas and he says, that I might have captured prints, but that handprint tells you I'm proud that it's a reflection of me too. What I want for everybody in this room is that every time a conversation is done, whatever you're talking about, whatever the subject matter is, whether it's candid or celebratory, whether it's difficult or it's enjoyable, whether it was a hard one about a difficult subject or you got to talk about what you're going to do on the weekend, whatever the conversation is, whatever the subject matter is, I would like you metaphorically to be able to go to a can of paint, put paint on your hand, and just stick it on that conversation and say, I'm proud of the vocal art I created in this moment. Because I was curious, because I asked what and how questions. Because I, I listened to your perspective before telling you what I thought. And I shared who I was, and I hope you share who you were. And we're, we can be proud of this vocal art we created. So how many of you are artists in the room? So you are an artist. How about just be a great one? You are an artist. How about not create many, meaningful and memorable vocal art? Your company is made up of artists. 
How about we just be great artists and in our little corner of the world begin to change it? Begin to change it because vocal art conversations, I believe, will change the world. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? Do we have time for questions, Danny? Uh, what's a good first question to get to know a person? What's a good first? Okay, so the question is, what's a good first question to ask a know a person? Okay, so here's a free piece of information. Asking questions is very difficult to build a repertoire of, like like a database of. So. Get one of those little moleskin books, right? Those little moleskin books and write one new question every day for a year. One new question every day for a year. That means you're gonna have 365 questions at the end of it, which will put you way ahead of everybody else. Because most people, their first question is what? How are you? Is anyone really sincere when they ask you that? No. So here are some of my, my, my three of my favorite first questions. Hey man, what gets you out of bed every morning? Um, What's the dream? What dream? Any dream you want. And three, what are you most excited about? What's the most exciting thing you're going to do today? So what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's the dream? What's the most exciting thing you're going to do today? Much better than how are you? OK, good. Good question. What's the most impactful conversation you've had to motivate someone? To motivate someone? Wow, good question. OK, so I love my wife. My wife's awesome, just for the record. She's home right now with three, three kids, and she's working on her own business there. And she lets me come here and, and talk all day. So my wife's awesome. Her name's Jessica. She's the best. And we were talking in Florida, um, or driving back from Florida visiting family, about conversations she was going to have. And she made a comment. She was like, and I just told them to be 100% responsible. And I, whoa. And she went, I know. I spend too much time with you. Uh, she's like. Thank you for telling me and demonstrating to me that we need to be 100% responsible for our actions for ourselves, that it's no one else's fault, that we are 100% um, responsible. And uh, for a guy who talks in front of hundreds and sometimes thousands of people about this, to be able to impact my wife, right? And for her to impact me, that's the greatest thing I get done. I hope to do that for my kids when they listen to me, but that's going to be for like 20 years. So we'll just stick with my wife right now. Good question. Somebody else? Yes, sir. How do you approach people that are um, the opposite of those four things you just laid out? So not curious, don't yeah. want to listen, don't, right. don't want to ask questions, and uh, aren't sharing with So the question is, how do you approach someone who is, I would say this way, a bad vocal artist? Right? How do you approach a bad artist? Um, I, would, I would do so in a relational setting, to, if it's appropriate, right? So you know, there's all these caveats. But I would just sit down, and this is a question I would ask. Hey, um, we've worked together for however long. This is the one question I might not have asked you yet, and we're not leaving until I hear it all. I need to hear your story. Well, what part of it? All of it. I want to know all of it, the highs, the lows. Because what you're going to learn is they're not bad at those things. They've been told they're bad at those things. That they're battling so many insecurities and fear and disappointment, and they're still living in their past. They're still living in their past that they can't get to the present, so they can't even think about the future. So you, by getting them to tell the story, you get to kind of cultivate up, not dig up. Let them do the digging. Right? You don't dig. People say, well, I just pulled it out of them. Just think about that. Do you want anything pulled out of you? No? <laughs> hey, don't, vocally, don't do that either. Let them share. And I would just sit down and hear the story. And then the second thing I would do, and I mean this, I would say, I just went to this really cool thing in Greenville, and I just learned something. Would you be open to me sharing it with you? about what I learned. So you hear their story, and then you share with them what you learned and how you're going to apply that to your everyday and do that regularly. And by modeling what good vocal art looks like, if this person's being themselves, really sharing their, themselves authentically with you, you will see change. Um, and I've seen that happen in a lot of people. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Somebody else? Yes, sir. This is a very related question to the one you just asked. Um, and I mean, people, some people are actively against all small talk. And mm -hmm. some people kind of see small talk as pretty beneficial because you can, it can be a, a kind of dance or like a probing on right. how, how willing is this person to communicate. Yep. How, how do you feel about that little dance? Yeah. So the question is like the dance of small talk. Like, how do we do that? Is it probing? Is it moving around? Am I asking that? Like, letting everyone in the back here. 
So there's so many things I think about small talk, uh, and that will be a conversation for another day. But to answer the question uh, as brief as I can here, you have to keep in your mind, everyone's two deep desires, the opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard, right? The opportunity to communicate and the respect to be heard. So I approach every conversation with that mindset. I'm not perfect at it by any stretch, right? But I approach it that way. So I don't think about it being small. Small talk is that probing dance like, hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? How's the weather today? It's great. Like, you're both in the weather. Like, you know it's great. I start talking about it as brief talk, which means I have a brief moment to get to hopefully fulfill some of your opportunity to communicate and respect to be heard. So I'm good with brief talk. I don't want anything small. I, I think big all the time, right? So if you're going to only meet one person for five minutes, like, help them fulfill the desires they have. What, what are you most excited about today? I'm just going to close this, I'm gonna close this deal. That's awesome. Tell me about the deal. We don't have time. Use up all the time we got. Like, so it can be brief talk, but you still can dive deep. And you don't even have to know the person really well. Just get them start talking about themselves, you're good. But this idea of small means, in my mind, you're not actually trying to help that person with their desires or help that person that day. You're just passing time. And that's bad vocal art. So that's one way to think about it. Yes, ma'am. What if you're being an active listener and the person doesn't stop talking? Oh. <laughs> yeah, so you can, you can email me at the John. <laughs> um, OK, so the question is, how are you an active listener when the person doesn't stop talking? So again, I, I'm, I'm always thinking of that other person at this moment, right? So generally, when a person won't stop talking and you're actively listening, it's an indication to me of how long they've gone without having those desires filled. Like they're almost famished. And the fact that you're listening, they're just going. They're like, oh my word, someone is listening to me. And like, I, got, I can't stop. And then normally, if it's in an office setting, the boss asks me, but I need them to work, right? <laughs> so how do you do that? So here's, here's generally what I would do. I, it, depending on the situation, and if someone's just talking, 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 and I'm really trying to listen. I generally, with open hands, I used to referee basketball, okay, open hands, not, not pushing, right, just open. I go, Coach, sit down, right? So with open hands, go, hey, hey, I don't typically like to interrupt, but I want to give you my full attention, and, and I really have been, and I've been hearing you well, but I'm getting to the place where I'm not going to be able to, and I don't want to disrespect you or devalue you, so I'd like to just schedule another time to keep talking. So when a person won't stop talking, but I know I need to stop listening, by just faking it is, is devaluing that person. So I just tell them, hey, I, I'll just go, hey, I don't like to interrupt. You've talked to me enough. You know I don't like to interrupt you. But I'm at the place where I, I can't listen intentionally. So I, I'll schedule another meeting with you or another time. I'd love to get another cup of coffee with you to continue the conversation. But right now, because I can't listen completely, I don't want to be disrespectful to you. And again, it's layered. It was like, what if it's one of my support, like all of that, and I get all of that. But I would say on those two things, if someone wants to stop talking, it's generally an indication of how badly they want someone to listen to them. But then two, you just, you can interrupt because, and then you put the response, you take 100% responsibility. I can't listen right now intentionally, so we're just going to have to postpone. Is that helpful? Okay. Somebody else? Yes, sir. So you, you mentioned that um, you wanted to get the perception of others of how they thought you were as a, as a listener. Yeah. What drove you to want to get their, their perspective? All right, one more story. So uh, I was um, 34 now. So about three and a half years ago, I was, I was whiny. I was complaining. I was lazy. I was disrespectful. I was ungrateful. And it was everybody else's fault but mine, right? Everyone else was the problem but me, and I made sure everybody knew it. And uh, I will briefly tell a story. I was away at a conference, and my wife and I were sitting across from this, this other couple, season life, season leader. And there I spent 45 minutes just whining and complaining, right? just telling them why everyone else was wrong, and I was the greatest thing ever <laughs> at 30, right? You're like, that's my millennial son. Like, right, that's, that's what it was. And he cuts me off in the middle of my sentence. And he says, how many years are you going to wait, waiting for permission to do what you already know you should be doing? How many years are you going to waste waiting for permission to do what you already know you should be doing? So when I pulled out of there, one of the things I wasn't going to wait for permission anymore was to learn everything I could about a conversation. And what I realized was for me to actually have integrity, I had to know what it was like to sit on the other side of me. 
And it really hit home when two of my closest friends, uh, Andrew and Mike, Andrew and I were having a conversation. He lives in Atlanta. And I just asked him that when I was down there one time. And it wasn't long, and it wasn't, I mean, I asked for it, and he said something like, you really want to know? And I said, yeah. He's like, well, man, you're always the smartest person in the room. You always have the best idea. You're always the loudest talker. You always, have, like, he's like, I'm not trying to be mean. Like, you're a good storyteller, but, like, you're always the guy. And I wanted to have, I, again, this whole idea of art of the conversation and learning everything about conversation, I did it for me. I never intended this. I wanted to be a better conversationalist. I wasn't going to wait for permission to teach or permission to study, right? I was going to do it for me. So for me to be me and to like actually develop me, I had to hear that and I had to take that. It wasn't easy. So what drove me, what drove me was taking, and I didn't have this language then, but I have it now. What drove me was taking 100% responsibility for me and saying, I'm not great at this, so it's on me. I'm not blaming anybody else anymore. And that was a journey, man. That was a journey. And you know, if you live in town, I'm going to grab coffee and I'll tell you about it. All right, y'all, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. I know you got to get back to work. Let's stay connected and have a wonderful